Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me here. I'm really excited to be part of this seminar series, which is, uh, which is great. And uh, I know quite a few members of the audience from whom I have received previously great feedback. So I'm really looking forward to present these ideas uh, here. So let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to do today in a nutshell. I will defend a thesis about the proper way to aesthetically appreciate nature, and I will tell you a little bit about what I mean about this uh, shortly. By drawing on instances of design that incorporate natural elements. Um, by aesthetic appreciation, I mean appreciation of an object that concerns how different Parts uh, and as Malcolm Budd has healthily observed, many different things can be aesthetically appreciated in the sense sport, juggling, uh, circus acts, furniture, clothes, wine, motor cars, machines, and tools of all kinds, and much else. So, uh, in, in line with this, I'm going to talk about uh, both fashion design and perfume design today. Uh, when it comes to the aesthetic appreciation of nature, what I mean at this stage is aesthetic appreciation in the sense I uh, just defined that has nature as its object. And uh, this much is fine. Now, a question arises about what is meant by properly aesthetically appreciating nature. And here we start to tread sort of slippery grounds because uh, there are, there isn't really agreement about what is meant by this beyond the idea that there are better or worse ways of aesthetically appreciating nature. And my understanding is that answers to the question as to what it means to properly aesthetically appreciate nature range from less demanding answers, such as what I take Zangle to be suggesting, which is that properly aesthetically appreciating nature means enjoying the beauty of nature, to more demanding answers, such as Carlson's or uh, Saito's. According to Alan Carson, properly aesthetically appreciating nature means not falling prey to either aesthetic deceptions or aesthetic omissions. I'm going to say a bit more about these uh, in due course. And according to Saito, it means appreciating nature in its own terms. It, the phrase is hers, uh, and by this she means something like uh, appreciating nature independently of human categorization or associations. I will try to navigate these grounds by trying to do injustice mostly to uh, Zangle's uh, idea of what it is to properly aesthetically appreciate in nature simply because if I started from more demanding views such as Carlson's, um, the position that I'm going to attack would be uh, undermined from the outset. But in the course of this talk, I will say something about how my proposal presumably does justice also to uh, Carlson's idea of proper aesthetic appreciation of nature. Whereas, unfortunately, what I'm going to suggest, I take it wouldn't really satisfy site was definition, but um, well, this is this is the best I can do for now. Now, once we have some idea of what it means to properly aesthetically appreciate in nature, uh, including the controversy that this uh, implies, a further question arises, how do we achieve the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature? And in answer to this question, many uh, proposals have emerged, and I'm going to focus on two broad families of theories. Uh, First of which is cognitivism or, or anti-formalism, according to which a certain kind of knowledge is necessary for the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature. That's why these views are called cognitivism. Uh, and not just awareness of formal properties such as colors or shapes. This is why these views are also called anti-formalist. Um, now, what knowledge do these views require? Again, this is a field in which views vary from less to more cognitively demanding. At one end of the spectrum, there is knowledge of natural kinds, such as tiger, horse, or mammal, two more sophisticated kinds of, for example, scientific knowledge. For example, the idea that forest plants need fire to flourish. So the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on the sort of, again, least demanding uh, end of the spectrum. So I will focus on cognitivist views that center around knowledge of natural kinds. Um, and that is just I'm going to give you an example to provide some background about why these views were put forward. Uh, a, an influential example by Alan Carlson is that only if we know that a roncal whale is a mammal rather than a fish will we be in a position to make 
correct aesthetic judgments such as that um, it is graceful and avoids incorrect aesthetic judgments such that it is clumsy. And that's why, according to him, we, we need knowledge of natural kinds for the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature. Um, so this is just by way of background. And this kind of cognitivism, as I said, is the one that I'm going to focus on for the purposes of this talk. On the other end um, of the spectrum, there are views, families of views that are anti-cognitivist or formalist, and they have it that to properly aesthetically appreciate nature, it is enough to be aware of its formal properties. That's why they're called formalists. Um, and relatedly, according to this use, knowledge is not necessary, and that's why they're called anti-cognitivist. All right, this was all by, uh, by way of background. What I'm going to do now is to first present to you a version of anti-cognitivism or formalism put forward by Nick Zangwill, and I'm going to provide prima facie support for it. Following this, I will actually attack this position and put forward a case for a version of cognitivism, according to which, uh, at least sometimes, to appreciate nature, we need a certain kind of knowledge. The knowledge in question will be knowledge of the contrast between appearance and reality in two domains about which I'm going to focus um, in due course. In the domain of natural kinds, about which I've already said something, and about naturalness, uh, of which I'm going to tell you about later. And I will conclude by exploring some ethical implications of the view that I put forward. So let me start with Zangwill's anti cognitivism So in a 2013 paper, Zangwill puts forward a version of anti cognitivism or formalism, I'm going to use these uh, two words interchangeably, arguing that to properly aesthetically appreciate inorganic nature specifically, which he explicates by means of examples, rocks, lakes, clouds, it is enough to be aware, to be aware of its appearance. Uh, we needn't, and indeed we shouldn't, know the reality or deeper nature of inorganic nature to properly aesthetically appreciate it. Um, and his main case for this is clouds. So he says, we routinely appreciate the beauty of clouds, uh, and in order to enjoy their beauty, which according to him is what it means to properly aesthetically appreciate clouds, um, we need only focus on their appearance, which is as of solid, soft and springy objects. And now we know that in reality, clouds are none of these things, but this knowledge is a necessary or indeed would be detrimental for our aesthetic appreciation of clouds. And uh, he thinks that this applies to inorganic nature more generally, that knowledge of its deeper nature needn't concern us. If anything, it would be detrimental. It would prevent us from aesthetically, properly aesthetically appreciating inorganic nature. Um, this leads to a position which he terms extreme formalism, according to which inorganic things only have formal aesthetic properties. Thus, the view of inorganic nature is we need not judge that things have their aesthetic properties in virtue of their natural kinds. We need to have knowledge of natural kinds in particular, and we should not judge that things have their aesthetic properties in virtue of their natural kinds. This yields extreme formalism about inorganic nature. And remember that formalism here is used interchangeably with anti cognitivism On this view, aesthetic judgments about inorganic things should always ignore their natural kinds and should only take their appearances into account. I oppose both extreme anti-formalism, which says that aesthetic judgments about inorganic things should always take into account, uh, take account of their natural kinds. And I also oppose, and I underline this bit in particular, I also oppose moderate formalism according to which Aesthetic judgments about inorganic things should sometimes take account of their natural kinds and should sometimes ignore them. And I particularly stress this last claim because this moderate formalist position that Zhang will attack is precisely the kind of position that I'm going to defend shortly. So he, he thinks when it comes to inorganic nature, we, we never need knowledge of natural kinds, whereas I think we sometimes do. Um, how plausible is Zangwill's position? I think that actually this is rather plausible when it comes to precisely the case that I'm going to be focused on, which is design that incorporates natural elements. And interestingly, both inorganic and organic. So Zangwill thinks of his thesis as applying strictly to inorganic nature, whereas for organic nature, he thinks that some version of cognitivism might be plausible. 
Whereas I think that there is a prima facie case to be made for Zango's thesis, both for inorganic and for organic nature, um, if you focus on cases of design incorporating natural elements. Why? Because if you think of, okay, here's an instance of design that incorporates natural elements, both inorganic, precious stones, and organic, pearls. Um, and my sort of initial reaction to, you know, what is our best way of properly aesthetically appreciating this piece of design that incorporates natural elements that is in Zango's terms, enjoy its beauty, it would seem that all we need to appreciate here is formal properties, colors, shapes, reflectance, and so on. And um, if you think this plausible at all, you might think that it doesn't really make a difference whether the components we're focusing on are inorganic as opposed to organic nature. All the elements incorporated in this piece of design might strike you as ones such that to enjoy their beauty, we only need to focus on their appearances, the formal properties without being concerned with the deeper reality. And, and I think that because of this, this is an interesting case because this makes Zangle's thesis initially plausible and beyond the scope that, for which this thesis was originally conceived. So uh, I think that Zangle's extreme anti-cognitivist stance seems to be initially plausible for natural elements incorporated in design, both inorganic and organic. So I think that this thesis is worth considering because it, it enjoys a certain degree of initial plausibility in the context of nature incorporated in design, both organic and inorganic. But does it stand up to scrutiny? So having characterized Zangwill's extreme anti-cognitivist position and having considered a version of it extended to organic nature, I will now oppose it by putting forward a case for a version of cognitivism, of moderate cognitivism, according to which at least sometimes we need knowledge, we need a certain kind of knowledge, which I'm going to argue will concern knowledge of natural kinds, but also the contrast between uh, deep nature and appearances. So what I'm going to do is to object to this version uh, of extreme formalism put forward by Zangwill, which I take to extend to include both inorganic and inorganic nature, but sh by showing that sometimes our aesthetic judgments of nature should take into account natural kinds. And here is going to be my first and main case for proving this. Um, what you should focus on in this picture is this necklace, which is made up of two distinct parts. So it's quite a very complex kind of design. Um, it's a necklace designed by Alexander McQueen in the context of what a merry-go-round collection. Uh, Sean Lean is the goldsmith that was involved in the actual creation of this necklace. Um, just notice that it has these two parts, an upper part that looks very so the ethereal and fluffy and, and this lower part, which uh, has these strands of like circular objects to focus just on the form of properties. And I take it that if you, if you just focus on appearances here, you will have a relatively pleasant aesthetic experience that is as of a very delicate and ethereal object. Now, if you move from appearance to reality and you sort of zoom in on this necklace, you will then gradually see that the upper part is made of lacquered pheasant claws. I mean, you might not know that these are pheasant claws, but you will see that they are objects resembling like bird claws. And I can tell you that these are real ones which have been lacquered. And now if you, if you move to the reality of this object, your experience of it will change and will turn to something that has a much more sinister aura. Um, and this is by design. So, uh, this is by design because here I'm drawing on the website of the Victoria and Albert Museum that has a section on, on McQueen's um, fashion design. And here it is pointed out that this necklace, made for a collection that had a strong Gothic undercurrent, juxtaposes beauty and the grotesque with its intriguing combination of organic materials, expensive Tahitian pearls, and lacquered pheasant claws. 
In this instance, the long strands of pearls echo the drapery of the 1920s flapper style gowns in the collection, while the inclusion of pheasant claws allude to a darker aesthetic. Although on the surface, the claws appear hard and vulgar, from a distance, they resemble fur. So there is this contrast between this very delicate and ethereal appearance from afar, and they are much more uh, dark and sinister um, undertone when you when you zoom in on them and you consider their reality. Um, and this is really like central for understanding McQueen's design because this design relies on this contrast, given that it's part of this whole collection that was meant to convey this contrast between beauty and grotesque. So contrast angle, it seems to me that in this case, the proper aesthetic appreciation of this instance of design requires both awareness of appearances, which in this case is as of delicate and ethereal appearances, and knowledge of natural kinds, which are pheasant claws in this case, which brings with it a lot of much more sinister and dark um, connotations. A Zangle style objection to what I've just told you, which is that the, for the proper aesthetic appreciation of this piece of design, you need to consider, you, you need to move beyond appearances and also consider deeper nature or reality. Zangwill could say, well, in order to find McQueen's necklace beautiful, it would be best if, we, if our appreciation stopped at appearances and we did not know that the necklace is partly made of lacquered peasant claws. And again, that much might seem plausible. So if the idea of proper aesthetic appreciation means enjoying the beauty of something, there is a sense in which once we move beyond appearance to reality, we're no longer enjoying the beauty of this thing because it's actually ugly and grotesque and everything. So um, there is an attempt at answering this objection, which is only having this piece of knowledge concerning natural kinds and the deeper nature of what we're observing will enable us to appreciate the cleverness of McQueen's design and to have a better experience as a result, because we will have a richer experience, which is now informed by this bit of knowledge. And arguably, we will have a greater enjoyment. I know that this is not a simple claim to make because Again, we're entering another slippery terrain, which is what it is to enjoy the beauty of something, but there is a case to be made that we have a greater enjoyment, even though it is tinged with this sinister aura when we have this piece of knowledge. So this is one attempt at a response to his angle style objection. But also, and maybe more convincingly, uh, I want to point out that going beyond appearances does not always take away the fun. Um, and have until having a less pleasant aesthetic experience. And in order to show this, I'm going to move to a different case in the context of, again, fashion design. This is a so-called Jardin Fleury dress designed by Maria Grazia Curie for Christian Dior. And it's called Jardin Fleury because it's meant to reproduce uh, Van Gogh's Jardin Fleury art. And so the, the pattern of colors is supposed to reproduce those in this painting. And this, I take it to be also like a sneaky way of saying, well, if you consider this, if you have this piece of knowledge, you will have a greater enjoyment of this piece of design. But even if you set aside this piece of information and you just focus on the formal properties of this dress, uh, no doubt you will have pleasant aesthetic experience, um, just focusing on, on, on its formal properties. And I take it that if you focus just on appearances and on the formal properties, you won't have an immediate sense of how this pattern of colors is achieved, namely what materials, for example, have been used in order to uh, create this pattern of colors. And if you move beyond appearances, and again, you zoom in on this creation, you will discover that this pattern is obtained through colored methods, which is something that, um, think is plausible will give you an even more enjoyable aesthetic experience because it is a pleasant surprise or at least it was for me when I actually saw uh, this dress because if you if you see it from not even too big a distance you simply have no idea what what these colors are what, what these sort of color patches are made of and if you zoom in the reaction is one of awe and a pleasant pleasantly balanced one because even though feathers are not unusual elements in fashion design in the same way as uh, peasant clothes are, this is a pleasantly surprising way of employing them. And uh, in a similar case with McQueen's necklace, 
you get a much more enriched experience by moving beyond appearances and uh, sort of getting to know the deeper nature of the components of this piece of design, and in particular by knowing the natural kinds to which the components belong. Um, and so it's not always, this was just to say, it's not always the case that moving from appearances to reality is going to take away uh, environmental beauty. Actually, it might enhance it. And this is a clear case of this happening, which is exactly what Zangle's uh, proper aesthetic appreciation of nature is supposed to achieve, enjoying the beauty of something. So a first entering conclusion is that contra anti-cognitivism, or at least contra extreme anti-cognitivism, according to which knowledge is never necessary, in fact, it's always going to be detrimental, the proper aesthetic appreciation of these instances of design incorporating nature um, involves both awareness of appearances, but also knowledge of natural kinds, and, um, and also the contrast between the two. So against extreme formalism or anti-cognitivism, it is the case that at least sometimes aesthetic judgments of nature, both organic and inorganic, actually everything I've considered so far falls under organic nature, should take into account knowledge of natural kinds. Now, this is a bit of a curious case of cognitivism, at least if you consider Zangle's characterization of the two families of theories, because for, he says, for anti-formalists, the truth matters, whereas for formalists, appearances matter, whether veridical or not. So he seems to draw this, this very sharp contraposition according to which, you know, one camp cares about truth and truth only, and the other one only cares about appearances. Whereas um, what I am suggesting here uh, is such that both truth and appearances matter, and the contrast between them does, which is, yeah, I take it a curious case of cognitivism. Okay, so, so now I've made a case for a version of cognitivism whereby knowledge of the contrast between appearance and reality matters for the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature and design, and I focused on knowledge of natural kinds. Now I'm going to move to the case of naturalness. So what do I mean by naturalness? So this is something that came up in, in this debate um, uh, in a paper by Alan Carlson when discussing the proper aesthetic appreciation of landscapes. And he contrasted the proper aesthetic appreciation of a natural coastline versus a man-made one which looks exactly like uh, the, the natural one. And he wondered what it takes to properly aesthetically appreciate each of them. Uh, and he says, if we, for example, perceive M, by which he means the man-made one, in the category of natural coastlines, to which it doesn't actually belong, uh, what it appears to be, we become involved in one or both of the following. First, failure to appreciate it under descriptions such as being carefully designed by man. And secondly, appreciation of it under descriptions which are false of it, such as it's being the result of the sea's erosion. So now we finally come to the concepts of aesthetic omission and aesthetic deception that I mentioned at the outset. He says the first alternative, first alternative, failure to appreciate it under descriptions such as being carefully designed by man, constitutes a case of aesthetic omission. We, we fail to credit someone with certain abilities, for example, being able to reproduce uh, an actual post, well, something that looks convincingly like an actual coastline. The second alternative, when we uh, judge that this is the result of uh, sea erosion, is undesirable as it constitutes a case of aesthetic deception, where um, we're deceived into thinking that what we see is the result of something um, that actually didn't cause it. And according to Carlson, this is something that compromises our aesthetic appreciation. So according to him, proper aesthetic appreciation of nature should not let us fall into either aesthetic deception or, or aesthetic omission. So this was just to give you some context about how knowledge of naturalness or non-naturalness comes up in this debate. And I think that this is again relevant to uh, the main case that I discussed, which was that of the McQueen's necklace. Because I focused on the idea that there was a contrast between appearances as of fur, say, or something ethereal, and the reality of it being constituted by uh, pheasant claws. But there is a further question to be asked here. What, you know, does it matter that we know that these components are actual pheasant claws, rather than items that merely uh, resemble as and I think it's also essential for the proper aesthetic 
appreciation of this necklace that we know it to be made of real, that is natural peasant claws, rather than items that simply look like peasant claws. Why? Because knowing the claws to be natural will result in a greater shock. Because we know it's that tissue which carries, again, all sorts of really sinister uh, associations with it. And this element of shock, though to some extent unpleasant, seems to be essential for the proper aesthetic appreciation of this design item for a number of reasons, not only because of what I mentioned earlier, which is that it's important to McQueen's design, uh, or at least to the design of this particular collection, to put forward a um, contrast between beauty and the grotesque. But also because, um, again, here I'm relying on the Victorian Albert Museum website, McQueen's, McQueen often contrasted fashion's glamour with darkness and death. He employed the skull as a decorative device and used the varied detritus of animal parts, skeletons, horns, and taxidermy as embellishment. Um, and through such references, McQueen connected with a complex history of memento mori, which romanticized death and exalted the disease while reminding the viewer of their own mortality. So again, it is central to appreciating his take on fashion design and this central theme, death and memento mori, that we know that those are real pheasant claws. Um, so it is, it is central that we appreciate the realness, namely the naturalness of pheasant claws, in order to appreciate the connection of this particular item with these recurrent themes of darkness and death. Okay, so I, again, this is uh, what I said is in order to support the view that by knowing this, we will have a proper aesthetic appreciation of these design items in the sense of having a fuller appreciation, one that is informed by the intentions of the creator and one that will lead to a much more complex aesthetic experience. Um, but if you care about the idea of proper aesthetic appreciation of nature in the sense of not falling prey to either aesthetic deceptions or aesthetic omissions in the way that Carlson does, then knowing the realness of the pheasant claws is relevant for this too, because if we thought that the necklace was made of items that merely resemble pheasant claws, we would be under an aesthetic deception. For example, we would be crediting the goldsmith with having produced these items that convincingly look like pheasant claws, which is something he didn't do. He lacquered them, he did other like very, very, uh, I don't know, very skillful things, but not that. So uh, if your view of proper aesthetic appreciation of nature is one that involves um, avoiding aesthetic deceptions and aesthetic omissions, taking into account knowledge of naturalness will enable you to do that as well. Um, here is another example to support um, the need for knowledge, both of natural kinds and of naturalness as essential to the aesthetic appreciation of at least some pieces of design incorporating natural elements. This is from a different collection of the same year by Alexander McQueen. It's called the Muscle Bodice because it is made of muscle shells. Um, and I think, again, this goes to show that to properly aesthetically appreciate this piece of design, it's essential that we know the elements to be, well, the natural kinds of these elements, namely muscle shells, um, which are other unlikely elements in fashion design. So again, to appreciate the cleverness of the design, we need to know what all these things are. And it's also essential to know that these components are real muscle shells rather than elements that merely resemble muscle shells for a number of reasons. Um, because, for example, appreciating their realness, their naturalness, will bring with it a number of important unsettling associations. Because, depending on, it's very likely that you might associate these muscle shells, for example, with dirt. Or if you, like me, come from a town, La Spezia, whose main signature dishes are muscle-based, you will have strong associations between uh, muscles and food. And so, it, which again, makes this like a really challenging uh, piece of fashion design, seeing these things that you typically associate with food on a garment. Absolutely. Please. That's a very, that's a, 
That's a very good question. I, I don't know the answer. I know that the I know that the muscles, like the, the, the shells in this collection were drawn partly from beaches and partly from food markets, the Billingsgate fish market, I seem to remember. I, yeah, but I don't know, and it's an excellent question. I don't know the answer. I don't know whether they were cleaned or not, but I would imagine that still what I'm saying holds because even if they weren't, um, you could still have those, those kinds of associations. To me, they actually, drawing on, on my knowledge from my hometown, I'd say that they look like they have been at least partly cleaned because otherwise they would be even crustier. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, even so, I imagine that they might still retain a certain kind of smell and so on. As an observer, you, you might not really be in contact with it, but you might have strong associations nevertheless, which will still make this like very, very challenging. And, and sort of, yeah, but, but, but good that you asked this question. And sorry, I should have said this earlier that um, you should always feel free to ask for clarificatory questions along the way. But uh, yeah, that, that's a very good question. And, and also sort of in support of what I'm saying is that, so not, not only there might be these associations that you've got with muscle shells, um, there is also this interesting thing that mussel shells, as well as other kinds of shells that were employed in this collection, I'm going to show you an example shortly, are known to be sharp. And so looking at garments that incorporate them might elicit a sense of danger in an observer. Um, and, uh, so here is another garment, which was the razor, razor clam dress. And an anecdote is that Erin O'Connor uh, a model for this collection reported actually cutting herself while wearing this thing. And I think again, it's important to get all these unsettling associations that make these very clever pieces of design that you know these items to be real and to come with all the you know possible dangers or you know properties that you might appreciate or not appreciate uh, with them. So another interim conclusion is that the proper aesthetic appreciation of these instances of design incorporating natural elements should also involve knowledge of whether the apparently natural elements are real, namely natural, as opposed to unnatural or artificial. Uh, and I will now show that we also need knowledge of their contrast in case of mismatch. Here is where of my uh, actual sample. Apologies to the people who are following this talk uh, on Zoom because this is something that I'm afraid that they will have to, to miss. So I I'm now going to turn from the case of fashion design to that of perfume design. And in particular, I'm going to show you um, perfume, my map, which was designed in 1979 by Jean Paul Guerlain. I need, I need more of them. Okay, I, I'm going to start by distributing these. Um, so I'm going to wait a little bit before continuing uh, to, to speak, because I first want you to uh, to smell this as much as you can with the mask. I mean, it's sufficiently powerful that I imagine you, you will probably still manage to smell it, I hope. Okay, great. Okay, I'm just going to let, let, let this wave around the room. Um, okay, I, I think, I think it, it's, well, I was gonna say, I think it's an excellent perfume. It's uh, known to be a reference Perfume in the history of perfumery. Got okay. Um, does anyone get anything in particular in terms of no, uh, like what it smells like? Rose. Yes. Oh no. So it is, and so Luca Turan and Tanya Sanchez, who are for perfume addicts like me, sort of reference uh, perfume reviewers. Say and Luca Turan is a, is a tra was trained as a he studied chemistry. They say it is certainly true that the unearthly radiance of Naima is without equal among perfumery roses, and so awe-inspiring that nobody even tries. So this is meant to be one of the greatest rose perfumes of all times. 
nearly in the same breath, they say the consensus among experts is that this fragrance, Guerlain's greatest rose, and I would say one of the greatest roses of all times, is in fact done without using any rose at all. Okay. Um, there is some unsettling details about this because I recently looked up the Guerlain website and now they say, oh, there is a secret ingredient which comes from a molecule taken from a rose. And now I'm confused because the, the, I mean, this is what I knew and this is what definitely used to be the case. I don't know whether this is a fact concerning a more recent reformulation of Naima, but I mean, you can be sure perfumes are such that they occasionally get reformulated and so their ingredients might be updated over time. So I don't know whether this is something that belongs to the latest version. What you're smelling is, I mean, I bought it relatively recently, so uh, it might be a relatively recent version, but I've smelled the previous versions and, you know, you get this incredible rose scent. And at least at one point it was definitely produced without any rose. And even if this case were to fail, which I would be heartbroken about, but it can happen, uh, it's in general the case that uh, some scents in perfumery are reproduced completely artificially. In the case of rose, you have the option because you can also draw on uh, like natural elements. So you've got a choice. And I think that reproducing, like so convincingly reproducing a rose scent in a way that's completely artificial is an incredible design achievement. And, but there are scents such as leather, which are for which you have no choice but to create them in a way that does not, that is not in any way based on real leather. Either you reproduce them completely artificially, or you rely on natural elements such as birch tar, which are completely unrelated to leather. So the, the point remains that you've got uh, something that smells convincingly like a natural element created in a way that does not resort to that natural element at all. And I think in this case, knowledge of the contrast between the apparent naturalness and the real and naturalness of the rose scent is crucial for the proper aesthetic appreciation of Naima as clever design. Again, if you didn't know this, you would be missing out on something that makes this perfume awe inspiring, as the earlier quoted reviewers say. Yes, so the appreciation of the cleverness of Naima would completely go missing if our aesthetic appreciation of this perfume didn't go beyond appearances, which are as of a rose scent, which it is in a way, but it's not rose based, or at least for a long time it didn't used to be. Like I said, this, this, this latest thing I found on the Guerlain website confuses me extremely, but you can know that a certain, for a long time, it was the consensus among perfumers that it didn't contain any rose, right? Okay, so when a perfume involves a scent, such as that of rose or leather, as I was telling you earlier, that is faithfully reproduced artificially, this is highly relevant to its proper aesthetic appreciation. We would be missing out if we didn't have this piece of knowledge. And failure to appreciate this contrast between appearance and reality, moreover, would no doubt constitute a case of aesthetic omission. If you care about that kind of thing in the context of properly aesthetically appreciating nature. And, and I stress if you care about that kind of thing because I'm aware of the fact that for some people, the proper aesthetic appreciation of something is less demanding and doesn't need to take into account of avoiding aesthetic deceptions or aesthetic omissions. But if you think that this is important, as I also think it is, there is an aesthetic omission right there for you if you don't know that these scents are completely artificially created. Okay, so, and here I'm approaching the conclusion. Well, here is the overall conclusion, even though I'm, I'm not yet quite yet done. So I started with a question as to what the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature requires. And I consider the prima facie plausibility of an extension of Zangwill's extreme formalism or anti-cognitivism, according to which it's always enough for us to be aware of appearances to properly aesthetically appreciate nature, both inorganic and organic. Remember that his original thesis was restricted to inorganic nature, but I, I made a case for an initial plausibility of this thesis extended to organic nature as well. Contra this, I argued that the proper aesthetic appreciation of some instances of design incorporating natural elements should include, first, both an awareness of formal properties of incorporated natural elements, such as the, the, the etherealness of the upper part of McQueen's necklace, um, and knowledge of the natural kinds, namely pheasant claws, but also knowledge of whether the apparently natural elements are real, namely natural, as opposed to unnatural, non-natural, artificial, 
end of their contrast in the case of mismatches, in the case, I hope, of Naima, and if not, insert any other perfume that uses a completely artificial uh, scent. Okay. Um, so this is the position I want to put forward. And now I'm going to explore very briefly what I take to be possible ethical implications of this. Let's see. Okay. So let me start with this practical example. So Stella McCartney, who is a leading figure in sustainable fashion design, has claimed that one of the biggest compliments for her is when someone purchases one of her um, fake leather products without realizing that it is not real leather. And I can see why you would say that. It means that you know, this, this design is especially convincing. But I also think that on the contrary, I think this kind of aesthetic appreciation of her products would be largely incomplete unless the people who, who say this, who can't tell these products apart from those made of real leather, were also aware um, of, the re of the real nature of these, these uh, uh, garments um, and of the contrast between the two. Because again, this means being aware of a design achievement, which is making something look like real leather when it is not. Whereas if you, if you only stop at appearances, you have a certain degree of aesthetic appreciation, but you miss out on the design achievement here. So I think, and this is the part on which, you know, I'm trying even more slippery grounds than anywhere in this talk, um, provides aesthetic grounds for preferring fake leather to real leather insofar as the former is a higher design achievement than the latter. And uh, moreover, this is in line with a stronger version of cognitivism, which in the bulk of this talk I haven't considered. A stronger version of cognitivism, which would have it that knowing the history of something is necessary for its proper aesthetic appreciation. And I'm gonna give you an example of this. So Cheryl Foster uh, has given the following example. Suppose that you're observing a strike, striking brightly colored sunset, which is this. And, and, and then you're told that these marvelous colors are the result of an air pollutant, sulfur dioxide. And so she has it that, uh, you know, in this case, if you have this piece of knowledge, then your aesthetic experience would then be uh, tinged with the appropriate re emotional reaction, which in this case would be some sort of melancholy. And there are views about the proper aesthetic appreciation of nature that has it that you need to know this kind of history for your proper aesthetic appreciation to have, for example, the appropriate emotional components. Um, and you could say that this applies to McQueen's necklace too, that knowing the background of this piece and knowing that this is that tissue uh, is also something that's going to be able to have the right kind of uh, emotional reaction in front of it. So I um, submit that the brand of cognitivism that I have put forward enables us to acknowledge a high aesthetic achievement in the production of fake leather and fake fur. And this is in line um, with support for cognitivism, according to which our ethical and aesthetic judgments should align. So part of the reason why um, certain versions, stronger versions of cognitivism, according to which you need to know the history of a certain object to appreciate, to properly aesthetically appreciate it, say that one, uh, one benefit of this is that this will take your will bring into alignment your aesthetic and ethical judgments in the sense that if you, for example, judge something unethical, your aesthetic judgment should reflect this and should also, you know, reflect a certain kind of uh, being unsettled and melancholy and so on. And you might think that this is indeed the case with a lot of uh, fashion design that draws on natural elements in ways that you think questionable. So this is a potential uh, benefit or at any rate a potential ethical consequence of buying this particular kind of cognitivism that I've proposed. I sit, so thank you very much.